You're listening to the No Schedule Man podcast with Kevin Bomer, exploring real stories and lessons learned with a variety of special guests. To learn more about Kevin and to access other episodes of the podcast, please visit NoScheduleman.com and connect and contribute at No Schedule Man on Twitter or Instagram and on Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud, all backslash No Schedule Man. Thanks for listening and enjoy the No Schedule Man podcast. I've been known to struggle with reality. It's not that it is any real mystery. Hi, and welcome to the show. I hope you're having a great day. I'm Kevin Bolmer. Thank you so much for taking some time to join me. Hope you'll reach out and say hello. You can do that at noschedulemancom Jump on our email list. You'll see the sign up for that in the upper right hand corner of that webpage. All my social channel links are listed up there as well, and hope you'll jump on board and reach out and say hello. Let me know what you like about the show, maybe what you don't, or if you have some ideas or specific guests that you think would make a good episode of the No Schedule Man podcast, I would love to hear from you. For something a little shorter, maybe you're on YouTube right now and you've clicked over to this because you've, you're have you aware of, of Martin, <laughs> our guest today, and you're thinking, holy cow, this is going to go for over an hour. If you like something a little bit shorter, we post a video blog of around about a couple minutes each every single week on youtube.com slash no schedule man that's out there for you too so we've got the the really really short and the really really long it's the in-between stuff that i don't really have covered yet (laughs) it seems like we're working on it either way however you're here thank you for being here i hope you enjoy the conversation today's guest is martin reed martin is the creator of Personal Victory, which is a fitness consulting company developed to help people determine and reach their fitness goals. Now, Martin's also an educational specialist at Lifetime Athletic. He calls himself a Tabata and Pilates guy. (laughs) Now, in addition to that, Martin has begun to do some speaking and has been featured as a contributing writer to the book called Dreaming Big, Being Bold, Inspiring Stories from Trailblazers, Visionaries, and change makers. Now, the main authors of that book are Paula Morand and Victoria Craig. Martin contributed to that book, and you can find a link to it from the blog post, the show notes with this episode, which is episode number 39 at noschedulemancom Now, what I think is interesting about everything that I just shared is that Martin and I really didn't talk much, if at all, about fitness or speaking or writing in this discussion it's really more about relationships both of us he and i have been through divorce communication reinvention self-realization i think i could say contribution and martin would agree with that martin also this is his term as opposed to mine but i really like it he he mentions a few times in this conversation this term moments of grace and what a fabulous thing when you can recognize those, especially when you're going to when you go through some really challenging times as Martin did, and you'll hear those stories if you keep listening. It's also about accountability and allowing your path to evolve and acting upon those signs. I met Martin at an event in December of two thousand sixteen and was really captivated by his story. He told some personal accounts of Well, the divorce was part of it. Going on another adventure and trying to overcome his controlling nature (laughs) was another part of it. And we we revisit a lot of that here where we had a little bit more space that he could tell the stories a little bit more fully. But another thing that I really enjoyed from the talk that he gave at the time that I met him and why I started by asking him about how he identifies himself with a lion is that he told a story about the people that that they work with or that he works with in his fitness business, that when they'll onboard new people and they'll try to really get a sense of their personality and their values and how they can be motivated, that there was a process that they would go through of trying to identify with which animal and the traits associated with those animals they felt most identified with them. And maybe if you have the chance to see Martin speak at some time, you'll be able to hear him talk about that and and realize that idea a little bit more fully. But that's why I asked him about the lion to start off with. Me, I'd call myself a turtle. And you'll know that if you've seen my speech, rise like a phoenix, race like a turtle. 
And so I'll leave this open to you with a question, and you can answer this in the comments section of our show notes at noschedulemancom at episode 39. What animal would you be? If you were just starting out with Martin, what are some of the qualities that you consider consistent between yourself and a certain member of the animal kingdom? Keep that in mind as you hear Martin talk about what he likes about the lion. It's an interesting and kind of a fun thing to think about, I think. Some of the key things I took from my time with Martin include, number one, embracing brokenness. Now, he tells the story of a broken bowl and how that the pieces that are glued back together actually become stronger than the other, what we'll call non-broken parts or the whole parts of the bowl. This idea goes hand in hand, I think, with accepting impermanence. You know, if you don't see the glass, or we'll say in this case, the bowl is half full or half empty, but embrace and accept and celebrate it as already broken. You can enjoy and appreciate each moment with it more. Plus there's that extended idea of once it's broken and then it's healed, you can still see the scars, but the bonds that are created in healing that Really, really, really powerful. I love the idea also that he talks about of putting flecks of gold in the glue to be able to bring the bowl back together. It it falls into the idea of awareness, I think. In other words, you can't get unstuck if you don't realize that you're stuck. (laughs) Putting Humpty Dumpty back together again, all of that. Embracing brokenness. Martin really gives a great account of that. Have a listen for that. Number two, an evolving view of courage. As he got into this, I could tell right away, and I had this sense when I met Martin, but I thought he and I are are, are alike spirits. Our souls are kind of in tune with each other because this whole idea plays into part of what I speak about in Rise Like a Phoenix, Race Like a Turtle, especially for guys. I'm generalizing here. I'm sure that this applies for women too, but I know from my own experience that there's a certain idea that I grew up with about what a guy is supposed to do. Suck it up. Push through it. Move on. If you have an uncomfortable feeling, just push it down and keep on going. Well, Martin gives a really clear account of how his views have changed on what constitutes true nobility, strength, and courage. And I happen to agree with him because I've found out that sucking it up and pushing it on, even when you've got that rattle of a bad vibration where you know something's not quite right, but you're saying, well, I'm supposed to tough it out. Not always. There's a time for that, but there's a time for the other side of it as well. Martin notes that he used to view transparency as weakness. So did I. He now knows better. I couldn't agree with him more. An evolving view of courage. Listen for what Martin has to share on that. It's fantastic. And number three, the significance of the insignificant or what might seem like something insignificant because there is a ripple effect. And this comes up several different times. And I think that this works both ways. One of my favorite phrases, little becomes big. It's the same thing. So you can make that work for you or work against you. When you leave somebody with a positive impression, with a a good feeling, we don't know how that's going to ripple through their day and the people that they meet and the situations that they encounter. But positive breeds more positive. There's that ripple effect the significance of the insignificant, but it can work the other way as well. Listen for Martin's story about the pebbles turning into a wall and you'll get that idea pretty clearly. This was, I think, a fabulous discussion that everybody needs to hear, but maybe even, and maybe even especially men. Again, I'm generalizing, but I'm going to reiterate, if you stand next to Martin, (laughs) remember, he's in the fitness business. He takes it seriously. As you'll hear him talk about, he was a football player and a really, really good one. And when you stand next to him, you you can feel the, the positive energy and the strength coming from him. He's a, a chiseled, strong guy. And it's so refreshing to hear him share the emotionally mature thoughts and ideas and the the evolution and self-realization that that he's been through that he goes over very authentically i think in this conversation here's my chat with martin reed on the no schedule man podcast martin i want to start by asking you about 
how you identify with the lion and how specifically that translates into your business. Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, the lion uh, analogy just resonated with me. Um, I like the, the, you know, the, the nobility of it, the courage, the, you know, the boldness, the majesticness of it. Right. So uh, all that stuff is cool. And that's, you know, for most men, I find that's the one thing that you, you want to be that person that's so strong or so noble or so ferocious or the king of the jungle kind of thing. Um, but then also, I also liked it because it challenged me to look at who I'm at, who I am and where I'm at. So, um, you know, am I really that courage or courageous? Like, am I really that bold? Am I really that fearless? So on, on two levels, it just spoke to me because it, it you know, it challenged me to be the person that I want to be. Um, but then also it's just something that I think, um, you know, it's just cool to look at. Like just that, I think it's just a majestic animal. Everyone wants to go and see the lions at the zoo, right. Or everyone wants to go on a, a safari. It's a, so there's something about that. Like we, I think just in general, men just want to have that sense of, uh, of, of strength and power and courage and courage and, and taking care of their family, you know, and all kind of stuff. So it, it's what I aspire to be. And it's also, it kind of challenges me in terms of where I'm at. So, um, and then that just bleeds into my work, right? Cause I mean, you always have to have, you always have challenges. You want to be the one who provides, right? You want to be the one who does all those different things. So on many levels, it just, it just speaks to me. I just like everything about that, that image. So you're not trying as much to be the lion at the zoo. That's always asleep whenever I visit, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> You're more of the the African savanna one. Uh, if you could take a minute and, and tell me a little bit more about how that model of identifying yourself with an idea of an animal plays into your business. Now, I've heard you tell a version of this story, but I was really interested in it and wondered if you could go into that a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah. So the the analogy that I used before when I was talking was about the way that they hunt. Right. So it's that analogy of, you know, they have one lion that is visible uh, to the prey and then there's other lions that are laying in wait. Um, so the way that they hunt is that the one lion would roar and then the other animal that they're trying to catch would run away from the roar. And then, you know, they'd be caught by the other animals that are laying in wait. So for me. I, I took that analogy as to say, like, almost like I was the prey more so than I was the lion and that thinking, like, okay, and those times when those those challenges in my workplace, uh, whether it's, uh, whether it's, you know, trusting them with something or I had to make a, a courageous decision that burnt me last time, or if I had to just, you just step out of the boat and do something that I've never done before, that's going to maybe propel my business forward. Uh, those are the times that I want to run like that like that antelope, when I hear the roar, I want to run in the opposite direction, but I know that that's going to just cause more problems for me because I'm going to run into another situation where I'm going to have to face the same challenge again. I can run away again, but then I'm going to feel frustrated with my business because I'm not making enough money or the same issues are arising all the time because I never actually confronted it. So as my line analogy, I also identify myself with the prey <laughs> at times in that analogy as well. You know, so what was going on in your life when you came to that idea and realization? Uh, you know, it's funny. It was more on a personal level in terms of my, my own relationship. But I recognize how they, they bled into each other. Uh, going through a divorce at the time uh, and, you know, kind of the aftermath of, the, of that divorce is what I do in my personal relationships. Like who who do I trust? You know, do I do I let men into my life to share my pain? Do I let women into my life? Um, to be that significant other again, all those different things. So it, it basically started with the question of love, you know, the question of trust, you know, and if we can't master those things within ourselves, then we can't master them in the marketplace either. So, you know, it really started from within and then it kind of, kind of reached out into all the different areas of my life. See, when you use words like you did at the outset, like a, a bold and courageous those can be taken a couple different ways, can't they, Martin? And it sounds as if you might have viewed them one way up to a certain point in your life and another way, like courage almost through vulnerability I'm hearing from the divorce onward. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. I used to challenge people when they would talk about being vulnerable and being transparent because I, I, at one point in my life, interpreted 
transparency or vulnerability as weakness. And after that checkpoint in my life, I realized that transparency and vulnerability and authenticity were actually signs of strength, signs of courage, because you've made it through to the other side in these challenges in your life instead of kind of cocooning or, or turtling like a hockey fight when uh, when the punches start coming, right? Yeah. So I think that, that that was a checkpoint for me where I realized that no, actually – there is courage in sharing your story. There's courage in getting through that story and using that story to help others instead of pretending that you never had a story, which, you know, a lot of times I felt like I did and I think a lot of people still do. What was the process like for you to fully realize that, Martin? <sighs> what was that process like? That's not going to be a short answer. I was trying to make it a short question, though, but you're, you're describing it yes. so succinctly that it almost sounds like you, you flipped a switch to just realize it, but I'm betting that's not how it worked. That's, you know, exactly. It's so easy when you're on the other side to just summarize it in 50 words or less, right? But, yeah. man, that was, a, that was a path. That was quite the, the challenge. And, you know, I had people in my life. I have a girlfriend now who... Uh, when we were friends would challenge me on those, those paradigms that were so, um, black and white, right? Like I, I'm just not going to trust him anymore. I just don't want to be in another relationship. Um, I just don't want to ever get married again. Like I was so jaded and so bitter and so, uh, yeah, just, just everything was so black and white at that point. So it was just, just this natural process of healing and time that came with, um, having to struggle with every little checkpoint that came in my life where I had to decide, okay, am I going to let this person into my world a little bit more or am I going to stay in my little cocoon and just stay in my house or stay in my workplace and bury myself in, in uh, things that make me feel good and not let anyone into my actual world. So it was a real relational challenge that, that helped me in other areas of my life. So I am very grateful to, um, to this girl that's in my life right now, this woman, she's she's great, she's special, and that and that, I think that she came along at a time when I needed someone who was going to healthily challenge me on my thinking because I was so black and white with a lot of these things. I was so bitter and so hurt, and uh, yeah, it really did make a change. It did make a make a difference to me. So that's you know that's years. In the, in the making there, that, that process of looking at it. And, and you know, there's one of the things that I, I, uh, I found along the way was that, that image of a bowl in Japanese culture, that kintsuji, it's a broken bowl. And, uh, and that resonated with me, whereas an image of a bowl that they would almost break on purpose just so that they can mend it and have a glue to put it together, but the glue would have like gold flakes in it. So it wasn't like you were trying to repair it and you wouldn't be able to tell where it was cracked because it had like clear glue. They actually put gold, mixed it in with the glue. So when you glued it together, you could see every single crack. You could see all the gold that almost brought glory to the cracks, almost brought glory to the fact that this was broken and now it's repaired. You know, it brought a sense of majesty to this piece that would would have been discarded but now we put it together and and the pieces that have been glued together are actually stronger than the rest of the actual jar or bowl and i think my life was like that and when she alex was the one who showed that to me um that image i was like yes that's exactly what my life was like and i kind of embraced the brokenness of where i was at in my world and once i started to embrace that brokenness that's what allowed me to come to a place of healing acknowledging I was broken or acknowledging I was sick so that I can get healing. So that's the longer version of that process is just embracing my brokenness, which allowed me to get to a place of recognizing that, um, the breaking was real. The pain was real. Um, and you know, like there are wounds, but those wounds have now just turned into scars. I am uh, at a place where I can look at those places where I was wounded. They're not op open wounds anymore, but there are scars that speak to what I've gone through. And much like that jar, those are almost points of glory to say, like, look what I've gone through. Look how much stronger I am now. This is how I can help you if you're at that place where you're still in a point of pain with this process. So, 
That's the long version of my succinct answer from before. <laughs> no, that's what I was looking for, and I appreciate it yeah. very much. You were you just referred to how that was years in the making. So mm-hmm. any kind of uh, – I hesitate to say solution, Martin, but I'll use it for want of a better word here. A solution to – you know, when you're, you're opening yourself up to new ideas like that and to really sort it out and to heal and to turn wounds into scars, that is definitely a process. So too is the making of everything that you were – before the break (laughs) yes so i mean when you put it that way it stands to reason that it would take some time to be able to find a new way forward although that seems to not be how we're wired as humans we want to have everything right now but with that in mind maybe let's go back a little bit earlier into your story and talk about you know your own development leading you into the industry that you're in and, and the man that, that you were and then eventually had become let's go back first if we can martin into take me into the idea of, of little martin reed running around what were some of the things that you remember that you were interested in and that you thought were and were excited about being ahead of you in life yeah that's uh you know it's, uh, there's a great book by john eldridge um, called Wild at Heart, and it speaks about what makes you come alive, what makes a man come alive. And it does come back to, as a child, the things that you love, right? So yeah. I, um, man, I loved cars. I loved fitness. I loved architecture. And it's, it's not like they don't really connect, but those are things that, like, my dad used to, you know, be on Auto Trader and buy a car for $250 and, and sit in the garage with his buddies and fix it up and, you know, go to one of his other buddies to get it painted and sell it. And he'd ask me like, what color do you want it? You know, I'd be like, ah, I think this one should be green. And then there'd be a green car in the driveway the next week. And then it's gone. And then there's a new car. Right. So that sparked my passion for cars. Uh, I always loved just running around and just being active. So as you know, my parents being from Jamaica, you know, getting up, getting registered in different sports and doing kind of the Canadian thing, getting your kids into hockey and swimming lessons and stuff. We didn't have much of that. Uh, so I came home one day and said, Hey, I want to play football when I was like 12, 13, 14. And that became my ticket. Like I, I played, you know, city ball and then high school. And then I was a top recruit for university and went to university. And then, and then after that, I, you know, I changed directions, but like the sports is kind of like what kept me going. And, you know, like even university, I joke about the fact that I went to university of Waterloo, which is one of the toughest schools to get into. And, um, you know, you need to get like a 90 average to get into engineering and all these different, you know, different courses and stuff. And one year they're recruiting me pretty hard to come to the school. And I had a 67 average because I just completely tanked on my algebra course. And, uh, you know, the head coach calls me and he's like, okay, well, Hey, we, you know, we got you in. It's like, perfect. You know, I'll just, you know, do the non-degree program or whatever the case is. And, uh, so I'm going to do my, my course in the summer to get my marks up and I'll get in and like, no, you don't understand. We got you in. So I am one of the few people who could say that they went to University of Waterloo with a 67 average because they wanted me to play football there that badly. Right. So it's you you take these things and they kind of steer your passion. Like, you know, you play and then coming out of school, I went into college, I went, went on to do social work. And, um, you know, after actually I should back up just a, a touch there. Uh, when I was at university, I wanted to get into architecture and just, you know, it just, it didn't work. It wasn't in the cards. So I went into social work because I like helping people. Um, and then came out of university helping people and went and did my master's in, in counseling, worked with youth at risk. But then I was at the gym every single day, you know, and taking kids to the gym. And I found I was having better conversations with kids in the gym than in a counseling setting. So after a while, I was like, well, why don't I just get into fitness? And, uh, you know, with the help of some mentors, that kind of became my path. So I'm at a point in my life where I'm rebuilding people instead of rebuilding buildings. You know, I'm designing and helping people and, and doing all these things that kind of connect the dots in terms of more along the lines of who do I want to become instead of what I want to do. Hmm. I love that phrase and I can relate to it, but uh, at the risk of interjecting. <laughs> <laughs> with stories of my own. I already know my story. I want to yeah. make sure that we spend time on, on yours. Um, I want to go back just a, a moment because I'm interested. I don't know if this is going to play into what comes later or not, but I'm curious, Martin, if you'll bear with me. The architecture. Sure. What was it about or what is it about architecture 
and what you mean by that, because that's a pretty broad term, by the way, that I'm interpreting it. But um, <laughs> tell me what a- a- appealed and appeals to you about architecture. That's a great question. I, I, you know, I just I love looking at buildings and just seeing someone's vision. You know, like you look at, you know, whether it's a modern building like in downtown Toronto or I've been to Czech Republic a couple times or like places in Europe and you see something that's like a thousand years old, 1400 years old and generations have built it. I think there's something about putting a vision on paper, pencil to paper and then see it manifest in a physical building that's going to be there for generations. I think there's something just awesome about that. And then the creativity that comes with it. And I think, honestly, that's the reason why I never get into architecture because I'm not a good draw. I'm not a good artist, like actually physically drawing stuff. And a lot of the best ar- architects were just good artists. And then they're creative. And then they add to the technical part to that. So I didn't have the base in, in just tr- plain art to add to the technical. I had the technical part, but I couldn't actually put what was in my head on paper <laughs> to, to move forward. So I appreciate those that can do that <laughs> greatly. Like a musician, you're a musician, and you get it. I mean, you can translate something in your head to paper, put a pen to paper, and then make it beautiful music. I can't do that. I like music and appreciate those who can do that. Um, but uh, so, art for architecture, that's it. So, um, but I just saw over the years that whether it's in a social kind of psychological setting where a person is at one place and you talk them through what I see as a vision for their life and that they own that and they create that and then see them come to the other side where they're standing tall or they're in a healthy relationship or they've rectified a situation with their, with their children or their marriage. It's like, it's, you're building people in the same way, you know, an architect's building a building. Um, so that's, that's the connection. That's the passion for me there. That's a really interesting observation. Um, I'm curious about at what age you were thinking that way. Just to relate my own experience, I remember not having any awareness of what you just described at all. A building was a building was a building was a building. And I remember going on trips with my family and and my mom would would talk about the the architecture and the look of certain cities. And it just didn't resonate with me at all. And then it's, it's almost as if you reach a certain age life beats you up a bit and you start understanding a little bit more of what it's about. And then somebody puts another set of lenses on your eyes and you're like, wow, look at all of this. And it, yes. and it was there the whole time. Absolutely. But it sounds like you saw that and appreciated it even as a kid. There, yeah. I think, you know, and maybe I, I remember as far back as like, maybe like 10, 11, 12, 13, like drawing cars, drawing houses. And, you know, my first co-op, opportunity in grade nine um you know i took that to i took a drafting course and then i took co-op in grade 10 you know um going to architecture firm and realize how awesome these artists were i was like i can never do this this is like my checkpoint right here find something else to do with the rest of your life because you can't draw so um but yeah i think i would have to say from 10 11 12 i was like designing cars and you know like beyond that like moving into these buildings and just even like it, you know, yeah, like, I don't know, I just, that's just been with me. And maybe, I don't know, I don't know when that actually, you know, what the aha moment is, but like, I've always had a, just a desire to just build stuff. And I think it's cool when it like, or just draw something and design it and then seeing it come to life. It's pretty cool to me. The ideas behind it that you described about somebody having a vision and then being able to bring that into reality and, and having it last for generations that even kind of falls back into the lion analogy that you shared with me a few minutes ago. But it also, I think Martin speaks to what I think is kind of an advanced awareness of the, I don't know, the, the, the texture of people's energy and, and what they can put into not just their life, but, but everything that they, they touch, whether it's building buildings or the contribution that they're making to their community. And it, from what you're telling me here over the last few minutes, it sounds like that's an inherent part of who Martin Reed is uh, in, in terms of how you interact with the world. How familiar or not does that description ring for you? That term like advanced energy um, is, is um, yeah, I th- I, I think that we all have that power. I think that we all have that creative ability within us. And I think that we just, some people recognize it and some don't. Um, you know, I have a 
pretty strong faith background growing up in churches and growing up with um, some pretty solid mentors and having a, a mother and father in my life who really did pour into me in those ways. So it, it gave me a sense that I really could make a difference in the world and I can make a difference in the way that I can make a difference, if that makes sense. Yep. You know, you know, a lot of times we think, well, I can make a difference. And you see someone like Tony Robbins with like a trillion people at every meeting and you think, okay, well, wow, I can't make a difference because I can't do it that way. You know, and um, and I remember being, whether it's like a youth group at a church and, and hearing someone say something as simple as never underestimate the significance of the insignificant. Hmm. And something like that resonated with me and thinking like, yes, like I don't have to make a massive change. I just have to do something that is significant to the person that I, I want to be significant to because that will have a ripple effect. You know, so I may not have the masses in front of me, but I can make a change in one person who makes a change in one person who makes a change in one person. So I I looked at it that way and thought, okay, well, what am I passionate about? Who do I want to become? And why don't I just do that well and see how that impacts the rest of the world? So how much of that were you processing through before getting into the fitness industry as kind of what I'll call a full-time vocation? Um, well, because I started in social work, I was, I, that was there too, right? Like, I was thought, like, how do I – I went to um, – when I, once I decided I wanted to do social work, I think that's where I made that checkpoint where, you know, at university and recognized quickly that I wasn't going to be a professional football player, um, you know, and – I think that's, you know, we always have these images in our head. And at one point I thought, well, I'm going to go to university and get drafted in the NFL. And then, I'll, and then I can stand, you know, on the podium with the Super Bowl and say anything's possible and, and impact thousands of kids that way. And it's like, mm, nope, that's not going to happen anymore. So what's your plan now? <laughs> right. You know, hmm. so from there, it's just like, well, you have to reevaluate. And so, OK, well, I'm going to get into social work. Um, I can still make a difference that way. I'm passionate. I like listening. I love talking. Um, hearing people's heart and hearing their stories and all those different things. So um, I kind of lost your question in the middle of that <laughs> rant there. Sorry. No, you're doing exactly what I was hoping that you were going to do and take me through the process of leading to kind of where, not where you are now here today, but get, really kind of getting into the meat of your career, Digging taking you through yeah. to the social work and then back where we were a few minutes ago into the gym and working with, with people in the gym. Oh yeah. Like social work is, I, I think that was, that was really my passion, just counseling people, just having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and seeing how you could solve their problems. And I mean, as I matured, I realized it was more about listening than be able to figure out and answer their questions and answer their problems. But, um, but initially that was what I thought is that I can, I can solve problems one-on-one, -on -one, you know, one-on-one -on -one with people. But um, one of the key points that kind of shifted me over from social work to training would be uh, one of the young men that I was working with and uh, we used to meet and he wanted to work out and he's like I want to get big arms I want to get a big chest or whatever it is so I was like okay well let's just start doing these workouts so I'm working out every day you could just come with me you just tag along I'm not going to go out of my way for you because you've stood me up a million times before and that's kind of like youth culture right like nothing's important and and whatever so I wasn't even going to go out of my way for him you follow me this is when I'm here and uh, so we started doing that, and, and that was going good. And, and I was like, well, listen, I can only work at 8 o'clock in the morning. So, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning for teenagers is like 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, it doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> so, But this guy was showing up. So this dude showed up, and he's like, okay, well, let's do this. So we're throwing down these workouts, and it's getting good. And he turns me one day, and he's like, okay, you know what? How do I get a six-pack? Like, really, how do I get apps? And I was like, well, let's start by dropping all of the sugars that you're drinking in those pops. Because I know you're drinking like one liter – bottles of coke every single day and and you're having like all these sugary foods so cut the sugars out and then come talk to me so he actually did that and at the same time he was cutting out all these sugars and showing up at eight o'clock in the morning this is the same kid that had like adhd and was on ritalin it was just like wild when we had like these drop-in centers he became kicked out and just you know throwing stuff around and causing problems and then one day everyone's like that what's up with Daniel? Like he's so calm now. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. Like he's been working out and stuff. So what had been happening was because he was waking up, he's going, he was uh, waking up at eight o'clock for workouts. He decided, well, I'm dying through my day. So I'm going to start going to bed earlier. So instead of going to bed at one o'clock in the morning, he's going to bed at like 10 or 11. 
And then also, because he's dropping these sugars to try to get his six pack, he changed his diet. So between changing his diet and changing his sleep patterns, it curbed all these hyperactivity behaviors that he was being medicated for. So at that point, I was like, okay, well, if this is making that much of an impact, I would have been spending like twice a week sitting down in a Tim Hortons talking with this kid about his problems. And instead of spending like twice a week in the gym, just working out with this guy and actually having better conversations over the bench press than I would eye to eye in a counseling setting, why don't I just try the fitness thing a little bit more? I have my master's. I could fall back on it. And, you know, like 12 years later, I'm still running a personal training business. And I never had to go back to that using my my master's in counseling in that capacity again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, you just put the... Uh... You just put the time machine at warp speed there and then jumped over the whole creation of the fitness business. <laughs> so tell me more about how then from that choice, what were some of the next steps that you took to get a little bit more involved at the gym and into fitness as a vocation? Sure. Um, I had a, a good friend who uh, was a personal trainer. And I, at the same time, I just had a membership at this club and I bumped into her, you know, this is like, we went to school together and then reconnected maybe, you know, five, six, seven years later. Um, and just chatting with her, she's like, you would love this fitness industry, like as a personal trainer, because I know that you're working out every single day still after football and I know you're still in shape and, um, yeah, just take your weekend course. I'll mentor you. I'll hand you some clients. And and I wouldn't recommend any personal trainer just do a weekend course and think that that's all they need to to grow in their business. But um, it seemed to work for me at the time. And uh, so I, I did the weekend course, hung out with her, and um, she took her time over the next year to just you know let me follow around when she's working with a client. And then when she went on vacation, she you know asked me like, "Are you ready to take on a client just by yourself?" And yeah, I'll, you know, I'll cover that client that you had me shadow for the last few weeks. And I do a one-on-one -on -one session with her and I'd be so nervous. Like, what if I hurt this person or something and then they never want to go back to her? Um, but yeah, but like I just started very slowly, had my full-time job in, in counseling and social work. And one client turned into two and I had some great people in my world. And they're like, you know, how many clients do you have now? And I'm like, I have three. So good, get one more. How many clients do you have now? I have nine. Good, get one more. Like, and just slowly steadily built my business to a point where I hit a, a you know kind of this checkpoint once again where it's like okay you have 15 hours of training a week and you're working 40 hours a week in social work and the girl who mentored you is deciding to go back to school so I had to make a choice am I going to just take on her client base and basically just take over her business or stay in social work so I decided I'm gonna just take it over. Like I, I was familiar with some of her clients. Um, I just, you know, I basically just took the reins on all the clients that she had and my, my client base grew and I continued to just work as a subcontractor at that club and I inherited a whole book of business. And from there, I just continued to grow that. And, um, and from there it just evolved to a point where I, um, I applied for a job at a big, a big box, uh, lifetime athletic that was coming into Canada and, uh, and as a system manager role, and I, I never thought about doing that, never thought about, you know, working for corporate Canada, working for a big, you know, big box gym. I was just doing my own thing and ran my business and, you know, working 25 hours a week and sitting at Starbucks did a couple hours and was making a good living. So I didn't like the idea of working 60 hours a week for the man, so to speak. Um, but I had the opportunity to work in a, in a capacity where I can start to build a culture and to build team and help other trainers. So it kind of, I was attracted to the thought of not just being a trainer, but now training trainers were the things that I was passionate about. And that's what kind of drew me into the, the role that I have now as a trainer, where I've done some education and onboarding and training trainers. And uh, it's more of a leadership role where I still do training and I still have, you know, um, plotties and small groups and all those different things. But there's also a large component of my job is mentoring and training trainers and helping them to create culture and a positive experience for their clients. Um, and that's kind of been the evolution of that. Through the process that you just described as you were evolving in the fitness industry and really kind of finding your own way and your own voice, so to speak, what was going on in your personal life at that time? 
Yeah, so that's you know, it's funny. That's uh, it, it was interesting how that all tied together because at the same time I was growing my business and that was going well. A lot of stuff was crumbling in my personal life to the point where when I was applying for Lifetime and working in that job in the first few months while we were hiring our staff and, and doing all these meetings and building this building, so to speak, um, I was going through a separation and work became my safe place where I could walk into the building and you know joke around with coworkers and bury myself, absolutely bury myself in work and just work a ton of hours and do the job well and just get some recognition in the work my achievements and get some recognition for uh, the hard work that I'm having there, that I'm doing there and, and all those different things. So I was kind of feeding my soul the affirmation and the sense of importance that I needed in the workplace because I wasn't getting that at home because I felt like I was a failure because my marriage was, was crumbling. I felt like I was a failure to my parent, to my kids because mommy and daddy couldn't hold their marriage together and all these different things. So work became a safe place for me. It became, it became a refuge where I can just go in and just take care of my clients and, and take care of my work and just hide at the same time. So those two things were happening concurrently and I had to learn to, um, you know, I kept using the, the, the phrase at the time was game face on, like walk into that building and have my game face on. I'm just going to just go in and make some sales or go in and help some people or go in and help my clients or go in and, and motivate our staff and then go home and then I'd sit in the driveway and pause and dread going in the house to the darkness that was there, the, the struggles that were there. And it wasn't like we were fighting, but it was just quiet. And it wasn't that love there. There was a you know a sense of, like, I just need to get out of this and you want my kids to be happy. And it was like, and then I'd go back to work and I'd be so excited to get back to work. Like it just, the, it was just a dark time, just a, just a dark, dark time for me. Where were you when you met your first wife? Uh, I was, we were young, 21, 23. I was 23 years old. She was 21. Uh, I was just finishing my second or third year of university when we met. And then as soon as I finished university, we started to hang out more. And, and, um, and from there, um, it just evolved into a really good friendship. And we realized we were kind of going on the same path. And, and um, yeah, from there, it was a pretty quick uh, courtship, pretty quick engagement, uh, pretty quick uh, marriage. I think it was like a year and a half turnaround because we had a pretty solid friendship base once we decided to move ahead and move pretty quickly. When did the kids come along, Martin? Uh, four years later. So 23, about 27. So we, you know, at that point, like because of my base in, in counseling, I was really passionate. I focused on marriage and family therapy. Like I'm pretty embarrassed to say that, like that was my major as a marriage and family therapist and I couldn't hold my marriage together. But I know that that's, you know, it's not that simple and, and it's not all my fault and, and life just happens. But that's one of those, those scars that I carry is just my thought that you think that with the masters in this stuff that you'd be able to hold your own marriage together. But, uh, um, yeah, we 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 tried and and uh, we tried. We thought that it was important to kind of have a good base uh, of a friendship and a relationship and marriage before we started having kids. And uh, so that was that's how we did that. So I have one boy who's fourteen now and another one who's ten. So four years apart, we had our two kids and and they're awesome. They're great. Like and they've adjusted and and um, life goes on in a healthy manner. So it's. I guess it is what it is, right? I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. I think you might have no. you might remember from when um, when we met in uh, December, I think it was, um, that I also am divorced, and I've got two boys that are around the same age as, as your kids as well. And it's interesting. It's a similar trajectory that I went through, that we, we had a really happy time. At least that was my recollection. And then I wasn't aware of things drifting when they were happening. It seems completely obviously clear to me now when I look back from where I am now uh, but I, I, I didn't know it at the time until the little crack had turned into a chasm. How do you feel about your experience looking back through the lens that you've now acquired through your experience? Right, well you called it a crack turning into a, a, a chasm. I call it a, you know, a pebble that was thrown upon another pebble and then becomes, it becomes this insurmountable wall 
you know, um, there are so many points that I'm trying to be careful with my words here too, Kevin, because I mean, I don't want to vilify my ex-wife. I mean, I, I do now in retrospect realize how much she tried to make things work. Yeah. Um, and I, and this story would sound a lot different if we were to have this conversation two years ago. I, it would be, I'd be laden with a lot more blame, um, whether on her or myself or on God or my community or whoever. Whereas I look at it even different now, um, you know, a few years out of it. Um, but yes, I think that there are some times that, um, actually I can even back up with that. Here's a story. I, I, when I looked at this, uh, my relationship a while back, I would, there was many times I would say she just gave up. She had just, she quit on us. She failed. And I just put on her. And one day I was out in my garage, I was cleaning up the loft and, and I'm, I journal, I like writing stuff down, whether it's a reflection or a vision or whatever it is. And I stumbled across a box of my journals and one of them was from the birth of my second child, who is now 10. And in that journal, I was writing down something to the effect of why am I so happy in my world right now? And my wife isn't. We're living in the same house. We have the same kids. We go to the same church. We have all the same things, except I'm happy she's not. Am I a good dad? Am I a good father? Am I doing things right? And I was recognizing her discontentment even 10 years ago. Hmm. And looking back on that, at that moment, I was like, man, like, how dare I accuse her of picking up and leaving and not trying when I have a journal here, I've documented that she was trying 10 years ago. She toughed it up for 10 years trying to make this work where finally she recognized that this just isn't how it's going to be for us. And that changed my perspective on it. And, you know, this is the first time I've even rec- mentioned in this because I, I don't even have the, a left of report with her where I can call her up and say, hey, I'm sorry, you're right. Um, or I recognize this now. But, like, I, it's my own kind of personal reflection that's kind of getting out there now. But... Um, I recognize that. Like, yeah, I, I did miss the mark a couple times. I did miss her cues. Um, there are some things that I, I probably didn't recognize that she was trying to make cries for help. Um, and she tried. She did her best. She gave it She gave it 10 years. I think I would have given up earlier if I was going through that situation and, and had that same level of discontent with the things in my world. And, and um, yeah, so, yeah, I think, like you said, like, definitely – it became a chasm. It was a crack and it, it turned into a chasm and I never recognized the crack. What were some of the things that you think um, she was looking for that that she didn't feel like she was getting? Um, I think validation. I think affirmation for uh, where she's at and what she's doing. Uh, there's many times that I think we had conflicts where I might have taken you know, the side of the other person and wasn't really that husband in terms of supporting her, um, taking and whether she's right or wrong, like you got to just kind of lock arms with your spouse sometimes and support them. And I think that um, among the many pebbles, that probably would be the one that, <laughs> that constituted the most pebbles on that that wall. Um, the times that I just missed that mark, I wasn't there for her. And I think in retrospect, that caused her to lose respect for me and for our union and for her just general hope for where we're going. And that could be totally wrong, but that's my own reflection on it. And, um, you know, I think that that for the most part would be the thing because I don't think for the most part, you know, marriages break up for what they call hard reasons or soft reasons. And, you know, the hard reasons being, you know, abuse and affairs and adultery and stuff like that. And soft reasons being the, I don't know if I love you anymore. Did we do this too early? I'm just falling out of love. And and it's those soft reasons that also ultimately dissolved our marriage. So I really, I really can't put a finger on it. I don't know if she could, if she was sitting on this conversation alone, if she could just pinpoint one thing either. Yeah. I don't think it's ever about just one thing. It's more no, about so the pebbles becoming the bigger thing. Right. But you can't have that without the pebbles. I, I think. Yeah. Anyway. Um, you said one more thing, and we're going to move on from this. But oh, you, yeah. you mentioned about in your journal that you felt like you were happy with where you were at your life at the time, although you acknowledged in the journal, which must have been a trip for you to get inside the head of your decade ago self that way and realize yes. what you were saying. 
Um, but you had an awareness, it sounds like, there that your, your wife wasn't happy and connected. And that you're saying that you were happy, but there must have been an element of you that, that – or I'm, I'm presupposing there must have been an element of you that was feeling some level of frustration at least because you had perceived that disconnect. So you were happy, but maybe recognizing – that you're not all the way happy as you could be. <laughs> Do you see what I yeah. mean? Is that how you felt? Well, well, I mean, the adage is a happy wife, happy life, right? Like, yeah. I mean, like, do like, I mean, like, if everything could be, I could win a million dollars if my wife's not happy. Like, you're like, why aren't we happy? Like, I thought it was, you know, that's the kind of yeah. place I was in. Where it's like, you look at things, it's like we have a beautiful kid, we have a kid on the way, and it's like. The house isn't clean enough or we need to do this renovations. There's not enough money or like, you know, we got in a fight with my cousin and you're taking my cousin's side. And like there's just no, like it's almost like the person's incorrigible. You can't find a place that they can find happiness. Yeah. And you think, OK, well, that's totally stealing all of my joy at the same time. And and it's not about my selfishness trying to find joy. It's just like I'm happy. Why can't we be happy? And the fix it side of me as a person and maybe as every man is, you know, that side wants to fix things yeah. and there's no sudden fix for it. And then there's a frustration that comes because I can't fix it and I'm failing because I can't fix it. And maybe it's not my, you know, problem to fix, but like I'm here in the middle of it. I'm going to bed with this person who needs something to be fixed and we can't figure it out. So then it sounds like you had two things going on where I'm almost envisioning you between two horses with tied to one end pulling you in one direction and one the other in, in where what would have been at that time the most important relationship or certainly the closest relationship that you had was causing great disharmony in you at the same time that it sounds as if your professional career was really beginning to kind of fully realize itself. And so listening to you talk, it really sounds like you're being pulled in a couple of different directions, just sort of energy wise and, and, and how you felt about it. How did you manage that? You're, you're, you're exactly right. Like I, I definitely was being pulled in many directions. Um, I, I manage it by just simply focusing on the things that are going well in my life. Like at some point you have to preserve yourself because, you know, I, I kind of learned in marriage that you, there'll be times when one person is up, is up and the other person is down. And if I'm going to be up when she's down, I may as well be really up because then that's going to help our kids and that's going to help our family. And who's going to pay the bills and how do we, you know, I don't want it to be a facade. I want, I don't like being fake. I want to be authentic in my happiness um, i want to be authentic in my joy and um yeah so that was a struggle and i just had to just enjoy the fact that my world outside of my house was was going well and take that joy back into the house and um and even you know like i remember saying that line about the significance of the insignificant uh one of the lines that i'd learned over the years is to give the best part of my day to my kids so I would have a great day and give good energy to my day, but then I'd still come home, put my hand on the doorknob, and just utter to myself, like, this is the best part of my day, and walk into the house and then just try and give all my energy until, like, my kids' batteries run out at the end of their day um, to making that the best part of my day. So, yeah, I was, dude, tired would be an understatement. <laughs> Because, like, that's what you're doing, right? Like, you're giving 100% at work and then trying to give 100% at home. And then, you know, and then also trying to mitigate someone else's discontentment from time to time. And she had her happy times, too. Let me be fair about that. But the reality is that, like, I was almost like, and I, I felt like this after Mar after our divorce, that I was in a world of pre, like, before my divorce, where I was happy all the time with times of sadness and then the years following my divorce, I was sad with times of happiness. And I feel like she was kind of in that sad with times of happiness world more than the opposite. So what you just described to me sound like an engine pegged at maximum RPMs for a sustained period of time and in with the energy that you're expending. And no matter what metaphor you want to put to that, sooner or later the engine blows. Right. And it, and it sounds like the separation and the eventual split was 
something where the bottom kind of fell out of your spirit for a while. How fair is that? Uh, ah, completely accurate. So uh, let me stick here for a second because you knew it wasn't going well and you knew there was discontent and unhappiness. So you can't have been completely surprised when it finally broke, could you? Uh, intellectually, no, I wasn't surprised. However, there's an athlete inside of me that didn't want to accept defeat. Yeah. And that athlete in me, if I'm totally honest with myself, would still be married and discontent and fighting for understanding why I'm happy and you're not happy in this relationship at this point. So as much as I, it, it completely rocked me and just destroyed me in many ways, I foolishly would probably still be in that unhappy marriage if it was up to me. And for that reason, I have what sounds like it may sound weird, but I have so much respect for her for pulling the trigger on this. So much respect for her for having the courage to volunteer to be the villain, to be the one that lives with the label of I left him. And, you know, and to hear me throw words like you destroyed our family, you left our family, you did all these different things and just put everything on her and for her to walk away anyways, that takes a lot of courage because I know that she's happier now and I know that I'm happier now. But if she didn't make that move, I'd probably still sit, be sitting here in a completely lifeless marriage thinking that one day it'd get better. Yeah, I, you answered the question that I was going to ask next, and that was what, um, how the fin, uh, the, the, let me try again, how the pin finally got pulled. Just to, to share with you while you were reflecting really honestly, my situation was she got involved in another relationship. So it was really easy for me to wag my finger and, and be the victim and, and place blame, right? But even after yes. that, um, it was really important to me. The same paradigm that you described, Martin, of viewing it as a failure of, of anything other than an outcome of, of keeping it together for, for us, for the kids and whatnot. But even after that, I was the one who ended up having to make the call, this can't work and I'm going to have to move on. And it, it, it took me months. That was a really, really, really difficult thing to do. And um, But you can't start putting the gold glue back on the situation until you break the bowl, right? Somebody's got to drop it. Yes. Yeah, I can't imagine how t difficult that was. I mean, it's, it was hard on my end to accept it, if you know what I mean. Like, I mean, not that I had a choice, but – within my own heart to say, you know what, this is actually done. Matter of fact, in my calendar, and this may sound sadistic, but on March 5th, it says, it's over, she said. And it almost becomes a checkpoint for me every year on the 5th, because that was a day, and this came up last Sunday, that was the day when she said, Martin, this is over. So now I'll look at that day. It pops up on my calendar almost as a checkpoint for me within my own heart. Where am I this year? One year, year one, and maybe I'm still bitter. I can't believe she did that. Look at me. I'm sitting in this house by myself. This is empty. I just dropped my kids off. I hate this. Next year, it's like, okay, this is life. Got to just move with it, roll with the punches, and whatever. You know? Next year, the year after that, it may be like, oh, look, yesterday, March 5th yesterday. How are you feeling? Pretty good. Life's pretty good. You know, like, and it, it's not like I'm doing it to beat myself up over it. I almost use it as a checkpoint in my life to say, okay, in comparison to that point when it absolutely devastated me, where am I now? I'm in a good place. She's in a good place. Our kids are happy. These are, this is a good thing. I am in a good place now in spite of the fact that March 5th happened. So I've the many times I thought to delete it. And then as I'm about to delete it, I'm like, wait, let's see how I feel next year before I delete that. <laughs> you know? So I don't know. Like I, I'm crazy like that, but I, it's, it, it becomes a checkpoint for me at points. So just look at where I'm at in relation to that moment. Yeah. I know what the date is when it was revealed to me about the other relationship, you know, in that situation, I, I don't obsess over it, but, but no. I, re I remember it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm I'm aware of it. So, well aware. but so what was going on then 
in your work life at that time when you're oh, you I mean your heart is 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 you know in the basement and I remember my situation my self esteem just took a massive hit and here you oh. are where you're you're helping to to guide and you know sculpt and and coach and nourish people and yet inside um you're just not the same person as you were. How did you manage through that? Uh, not very well. Uh, <laughs> there's days where it was awesome, game face on, rocked it out, no one would be any the wiser. And then there's days like uh, one day when I got pulled over by the police. And uh, I was driving, it was probably 5 o'clock in the morning, going for my 5 a.m., my 5.30 clients. And uh, driving down, uh, probably the day after she said this to me, or we, one of those conversations where we were talking, and she would be brutally honest about the fact of our, the reality of our situation. And um, so, you know, went to bed distraught, woke up you know, like a zombie, got in the car, and I'm driving down the road. And uh, this guy, this guy in like a GMC Jimmy truck, passes me. And then I pass him, and then he passes me, and I pass him, and and we're effectively just racing down Winston Churchill, or Animals Parkway. So I, I blow past him. He makes a right, makes a left turn, and he he gets a, his his stop. So he turns off, and I'm still going pretty quick. And there's a car coming up in a distance, so I slow down, you know, pass that car, slow down, go back to speed, the you know regular high speed of the road, and then uh, that car was an unmarked police car. So he pulls me over, you know, the cherries come on. He pulls me over right in front of that division 11, right there at Air Mills Parkway. Like, so I pull off in front of the police station there at the side of the road. And, uh, there's just, enough, just so happened. All the cops were kind of just coming in, in between their shifts. So, um, guy gets out of his car and he says to me, buddy, you do realize I could take away your license right now. You were going 170 Yikes. in an 80 zone. And my response was, I don't care. Take my license. My wife is leaving me. I have nothing anyways. Hmm. And he took my license. He went back to his car and I sat there and just bawled. I was just like, you know, I had to find my license. I just kind of took stuff away. You know, took my license, handed to him, sat there and just like sat there and just just, just bawled. I was just like, man, I have nothing. And now I'm going to lose this too. And I saw, you know, like two or three cars came up and they kind of surrounded my car. And this cop waved them off. He said, like, I got this. You know, so those cars left. And he came back and he's like, uh, you know, I'm supposed to take your license away now. Right? And I was like, take it. I have nothing else anyways. I, what will that, What difference will that make at this point? He's like, what do you do? And I said, I'm, I'm a personal trainer. Where are you going? I, I'm a client's right over here around the corner at this studio. And he says, you're trying to tell me that you take care, care of people for a living and you're out here trying to kill yourself on the road. And I was like, what do I have left? Who cares? He goes, I want you to take some time. Get your journal out. Get a book. Write some stuff down. Like, Call your clients. Cancel your clients, go to a coffee shop, sit down and just write some stuff down, collect your thoughts. And he let me go. And uh, I went and trained my first two clients and then took the rest of the day off and just sat in a coffee shop and just wrote down some stuff and just kind of figured my life out a little bit and just kind of collected my thoughts. And um, yeah, it was a huge moment of grace where I could have lost so much. And this guy just recognized my brokenness and, um, and, and let it, let it go. And I did, I did that. I reflected on that for quite a while. And it was many months later in a, you know, in the Starbucks, I recognized the cop and his buddy in there. And I, I walked up to him and said, you know, how you doing? My name's Martin Reed. Um, I'm the guy you pulled over going a buck 70 on Air Force Parkway. <laughs> couple months back he's like oh yeah he's just how you doing i said you know what thank you for just recognizing where i was at and giving me that that opportunity to just collect myself that is what i needed that day i didn't need to be you know 
you know, punished to the extent of the law. I just needed a moment to myself and you gave me that moment. I just want to let you know, I appreciate that. And he said, yeah, I hope you're doing better, man. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm in a good spot now. That, that was, that is, a, I just, I couldn't thank him enough. And, you know, that was in the conversation. I've never seen him since. And that was into that. But that was one of those moments of grace that I saw many of in those times when I wanted to just give up completely because this athlete had failed in, in the sport of marriage. And uh, I know it's not that simple, but that's how I saw it at the time. Well, that's an example of those little ripples, right? And how we don't really necessarily know the difference that we're making just by doing what we do. And, yep. you know, when you're in it and you're surrounded in darkness and at best you're fumbling around, you know, trying to find a light switch. And at worst, you've stopped even caring. Just let it stay that way. Uh, and yeah. someone someone lights a candle for you. Um, yes. It's so easy, I think, Martin, for us to think that we have to do these big bombastic things and make these great big grand achievements and make a certain amount of money or have a certain amount of celebrity or, or, or when we're all just people. And when that humanity comes through, especially at those moments, how do you measure the value of the impact of even just that one moment that you described that just gave you enough breath to be able to take that next step? Yes. Oh man, like yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like, you can't, you can't. It's the it's significance of the insignificant, right? For him, he just I let this guy go today. Yeah, <laughs> I said you should have seen this guy. He was going 170 kilometers an hour, and I just <laughs> let him go because he was crying like a baby when I got to his car. <laughs> like they probably talked about that for weeks, and for them, it's no big deal. They see it all day, and for me, that's the difference between me just like hurling myself into a deeper depression with one more thing lost in my world or not. Yeah. Um, you were <laughs> the, the, the phrase that I was around when I was in the stock car racing industry for a while, when we would say that you were sending her, you were sending her yeah. down the highway at a buck 70. Um, there are a few things I want to get to here still, if you're okay for a few more minutes. Um, yeah. You sounded like you have, done some writing you did some journaling and then you started doing some some writing or at least getting um stock of your thoughts where did dream big be bold come along how did that develop that was um that was a fantastic opportunity for me because i um in running my business as we talked about earlier there was a year where i won a committed entrepreneurs award in 2010 and in that same year uh Paula Morand, the author, sorry, the, the publisher of this book and marketing guru was also on this trip. So we connected there, met her husband, just fantastic people. We just, we just really bonded on this trip. And, uh, you know, fast forward to 2016, she was one of the speakers at a fitness conference. So I was at their, you know, their ball there. They had the social the night before and I was talking with her and we just exchanged numbers, caught up. And, and then, you know, on the following Friday, she sent me an email and said, basically, I'm working on a book and I have some contributing authors and we're pretty late in the game, but we still need two more authors. So if you are interested in writing this book and writing your, your chapter, let me know by Monday, it's going to be published by October and it's going to be out in December and it's August right now. So <laughs> no pressure though, huh? <laughs> no pressure at all. So let me know on Monday if you want to be part of this book. And I think that one of those things that because I've always been journaling and always been collecting my thoughts and, and, and always have passion to do it. It was a knee jerk reaction. Yes. Like I, I played it cool and, and gave it 24 hours, but like I could have said yes on the spot. Um, so I said yes, and from there, I almost did a beta test with my Instagram and uh, Twitter and, for, and, and Facebook, where I always have these Finish Strong Fridays, where I you know, have some kind of deep, profound thought or some stupid image or whatever it is, and, and things just make people laugh and make people think. And uh, so I started to look at some of the New Year's resolutions that people would say in January, and it was October now, and I'd say, well, how are you doing with your resolutions? to take care of yourself or to exercise or to put yourself first or to heal yourself or to whatever it is. So I took those one-liners and threw them out every day 
and just had a little bit of a running commentary. And I took a picture that I may have stock or something that I did, like going to the doctor on my birthday and, and requesting every single possible test because I wanted to make sure that I had a checkpoint for my own health because I was I wanted to just take ownership of that or that kintsuji thing with the bowl and healing yourself or or the image of you know the plane and um and uh you know when you when you're on a plane they say you know put your mask on first and then attend to your kids and and how do we take care of ourselves first and and so i i use all these different analogies and threw them out and just based on the feedback that i got i use that as a material for my book so I just found out from there, like, this is the things that really people really need to speak to. So let me just unpack those a little bit more in this book. Let me just share a bit of my stories in this book and, and recognize that, you know, people have awesomer stories than I do, but my story is an authentic story of, of challenge and, and, and everyone has a challenge. Everyone has a checkpoint. So why not use mine and, and see if that helps one person? So it wasn't a hard write. It was a simple collection of, of my thoughts, like a police officer told me to do many years before that now is, you know, come to be published. And and I hope that it does speak to people. I hope that people do hear something in it and and that my, my intent with it was not to make a million dollars off a book, but to use that as a platform to share like the day that I met you where I could unpack a story and just share a little bit more about what that story means and, and, and provide the story behind the story, so to speak with each one of those, you know, little excerpts from the book. So the day I saw you speak, you told a story about going to Japan and specifically you framed it as maybe I can say it this way. If I recall correctly, Martin, you described yourself as being somewhat my word, not yours, but uptight and not really open for, that kind of an adventure that didn't have a script to it. Yes. Can you retell a little bit about that and then what the result was of coming out of actually having the experience? Yo, yeah, absolutely. So coming back to Alexandra, my girlfriend, uh, in this, in this situation, she was a flight attendant. So with all of her connections, she has, you know, she had buddy passes. So when my best friend who lives in Japan came in the summer and they connected, it was just like, we can go to Japan. How about we just kind of eeny, meeny, miny, mo it across the whole country and just, you know, just take the, you know, the trains and just figure stuff out. And that was like the scariest proposition ever to me because I don't like being in Toronto without Google Maps running on my phone, right? Because like, <laughs> and then you're going to add a language barrier and 2,400, I don't know how many kilometers it is from, from here. Like it's thousands of kilometers. So that kind of thing, just, it was scary. That whole thought I, mean, I played it cool, game face on, let's do this. But I was like, first thought, I was like, no, like, let's get a map. <laughs> let's get a plan. Um, but we did it and we did it that way. And I, and, you know, I learned through this process of, you know, as much as it sounds kind of morbid, okay, but like through my process and the dying of that, that marriage, that really, what's the worst that can happen to me? Like, I, I couldn't really put my finger on what is really the worst that could happen to me if I went to Japan without a plan and my best friend lives there and I'm with somebody arm in arm like I think I'll be all right so I kind of just said yes blindly knowing in my head that like this is just (laughs) ill-advised by Martin standards so I did it and we did it and uh yeah like my first experience was coming off the train coming off the plane and you're right in the uh Kyoto or I think it was what, what was someplace in Tokyo in their airport and then the trains are there and the first text message that my friend sent me was just this maze of words I can't you know even describe right so it's like you know I have a piece of it here and it's like coming into Higashi use the Cebu line but don't take the the Kido Shagi line because that's the green line and it's express line and you have to go to Ikuburo because and like it's just like this it was way over my head and I was like I just almost wanted to vomit right there on the train. <laughs> I'm like, what did I sign up for, right? So it got better after that. But I mean, like, that was like, I almost wanted to just point my finger and see, just see, this is why I didn't want to come. And I, la, la, la. Um, but yeah, but from there, it just got better and better, right? I mean, that's exactly what we wanted to do, is just have that sense of adventure. And, and she lives for those adventures. And she, you know, I, she's drawn me out of my shell in so many ways where, 
you know, we saw 11 cities in 10 days and we stayed like we were finding hotels while we're on the train to the city we're going to go to. And, you know, and we just we were off the beaten path and just taking bikes and just discovering stuff and, and having fun getting lost. And we found like some amazing, amazing pieces of culture and, and history that um, that I wouldn't have known otherwise, like just on a sidebar. The um, if you ever look at one of those pictures of Mount Fuji, next time just even Google it. Look at a picture of Mount Fuji; you'll always see evergreens in the foreground. I thought nothing of it until we went on bike to this place called Mihu Beach, and it's a beach that is, um, you know, that vantage point of Mount Fuji. There's water in front of it, so you're not standing at the base of the mountain looking at a rock face. You're actually, you know, a hundred kilometers away looking at it from across the water. But that place across the water where you can see the mountains actually is this sacred evergreen forest. And in the evergreen forest, legend has it that an angel came down and met with a fisherman. So in Chinese culture, this is a sacred place where like there was buses, like we didn't see it, there's a parking lot. And there was like 15 buses of people coming from China who wanted to see the sacred forest where this fisherman met this angel. And then there's there's souvenirs and there's a sacred rocks and then there's all these different things there. That's not in any North American book I've ever seen. But this sacred evergreen forest is, is placed in the foreground of all these pictures of Mount Fuji because it's so significant to that culture. And if we hadn't taken this adventure and if I didn't almost vomit on some subway track because I didn't want to be there because it was so scary – and then didn't just go with that. Who never would have had bikes. Who never would have went to this Mihu Beach on a ferry. And never would have found this this path that led into a sacred forest. Never would have even heard this story about these evergreens. And now I look at these pictures of Mount Fuji. And like, there's those trees. I have been to that forest. I know why there's trees in every single picture of Mount Fuji. Because I was at that place. Those adventures that we that I didn't want to embrace were there. Because I just, you know, like that lion. I just decided to run towards that roar instead of towering away you know so it all comes full circle i just saw there's so many adventures and so many things that come out of uh, that one checkpoint like what's the worst that can happen i've already experienced the worst and then stood up I can continue to walk i'm okay so why would i be scared of anything else so along that along line of that thought line then of thought martin how do you consider, you consider yourself different yourself now and how you approach life approach than you did maybe say 10 years <laughs> even five years ago Oh man, it's uh, I want to embrace those inv- adventures. I'm not going to stand here and, and say that I'm you know calm, cool, and collected when those adventures come. It's still that same like step off in a corner and breathe deep ten times and then say yes. So it's not just like yeah, let's do it. It's like okay, let's do it. <laughs> like I'm still going to get to that point, but I still recognize that yes, this is what I need to do. So just run in that direction of that roar. Just remind myself every single time. Um, I say that many times when I'm talking about this story that I like the person that I am now. I loathe the process that I went through to get to this place, but I wouldn't want to be the person I was before this process happened. I was too safe, too secure, too overconfident, too blind to the adventures and the life and the rich life that I have now because I was almost too afraid to take any chances. And and it took those experiences, it, take, it took those losses to define me, the person I am now, and to be the parent that I can be now, understanding that, you know, there are going to be some disappointments in life, and you will survive. So. I could say the same thing about my own journey, Martin, and uh, I'm just thrilled to hear that you're in as good a place as you are now. How has that all translated into your professional life, and where are things uh, at this point, as far as that's concerned? Um, it's uh, Well, I'm still working at Lifetime. I still run my business, Personal Victory, and I, I love using the platform of this book, and even opportunities like this. Hey, Kevin, this is awesome. I'm loving this this conversation. Um, using these opportunities to just connect with people, like in whether whatever capacity it is, like that really is my passion to to, to connect with people. So I, I don't have a master plan, like I have this you know strategy to make a million dollars before the year's out, but I, I do want to just take opportunity to say yes to every door that opens, and whether it's more speaking engagements, I'd love to have you know a goal of of speaking at least once a month. 
um, you know, continue to grow my client base in terms of training and to take on different opportunities to consult and to grow other people's businesses and to train trainers. It's just so vast. I mean, I'm just really just saying yes to whatever gets placed in my lap to do. Um, and just loving every moment of it. So, you know, that it just turns into that, like just not being afraid to say yes, not being afraid to say no, if it's not in line with what my, what my vision is, what my passion is. I'm here to help however I can. I'm really grateful for this time. I encourage you to continue to investigate the speaking, Martin, because the, the talk that you gave when I saw you was, was fantastic. It really stuck with me. It's made a difference. And um, I'm, I'm sure that anybody that takes the time to listen to what you've shared today will be touched by it and empowered by it too. And we don't know what those, those ripples might be, the, the significance of what we might consider insignificant, although I don't consider it that. I'm, I'm really, really yes. grateful, and thank you for taking the time. Thanks so much, Evan. I really appreciate it. You can connect with Martin online on Instagram. You can find him at Personal Victory. Same thing on Facebook and Twitter. So his Facebook page is facebook.com slash personalvictory. And on Twitter, at Personal Victory. Give Martin a shout. Say hello. Let him know that you heard him on the No Schedule Man podcast. And uh, I want to thank him again for spending that time with me. I hope that we'll get the chance to talk again and talk about Pilates and Tabata <laughs> and some of that other stuff. And I also want to invite you to chime in on the blog post, the show notes for this episode, which is number 39 at NoScheduleman.com. Martin's a lion. I consider myself a turtle. What animal would you consider yourself to be like and why? I would love to have your comments on that. Meantime, you can reach me at KevinBolmer.com, NoScheduleman.com. Takes you to the same place. All my social channel links are listed up there, as is the sign-up for our email list. I hope you'll join us on the journey and add your voice to mine. Thanks again for listening and making some time. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll join me next week on the No Schedule Man podcast. Just a little deja